Welcome to Lindsay's Fallout. I'm your host, Lindsay. Today we're going to be talking about Vault 4. I talk about social issues, so if you want a break from that, you're going to want to pass on this video. My nervous system responds very poorly to being misunderstood, so I'm humbly asking that you give me the benefit of the doubt if I say anything that rubs you the wrong way. Pause the screen for more details. I don't think that Vault 4 was even on my list of, like, things that I might talk about soon. It just suddenly hit me, like, this is really where I'm at this week. Remember how, like, I didn't want to talk about Norm until I talked about privilege first? I feel like this time, eventually I want to talk about communism. But I felt like I didn't want to talk about communism until I talked about Vault 4. It'll make sense why this connects soon. But Vault 4 gives us a great launch pad to talk about cultural relativism. Basically the idea that moral codes are products of cultural norms and practices. And so what's considered okay or decent behavior in one culture totally might not be in another culture. One of my favorite, most direct examples of this in sci-fi in general would be the part in Dune when Stilgar, the leader of the Fremen, spits on the table in front of Duke Leto. Everyone gets tense and the Duke's men are about ready to throw hands, but I think in different iterations is a different character who does this. But somebody intervenes and explains the situation that among the Fremen, spitting is a sign of great respect for reasons that actually make sense. After all, in the desert, water is extremely scarce and precious, so by spitting, Stilgar is offering a portion of his body's moisture. He's making like a sacrifice, like he's giving up something precious, and so he intends that to be very humble and respectful. On the Fallout show with Vault 4, they play around with a similar idea. It gives us a chance to confront, like, why? do we find certain things rude? Why do we find certain things scary? And how much of that is making judgments of certain actions and, and certain gestures completely based on context that doesn't currently apply? So we're gonna start after my favorite scene in the entire show that's definitely gonna have to get its own video. Maximus is wounded, he's just been shot in the shoulder by a fiend, and they come across this building, Hawthorne Medical Laboratories, a division of Vault Tech Corporation. Maximus stops Lucy and he's like, whoa, there could be anything in there. Like, have you ever played a Fallout game? Have you ever seen a centaur? What if there are centaurs in there? But Lucy's like, yeah, well, what if there's first aid in there? It says medical laboratories. So Lucy goes full Leroy Jenkins into there, apparently aggressively enough to make it the whole way down that hallway and down the chute in like a very short period of time. Whatever. It works for the scene. So Maximus goes in there after her and y'all, I'm telling you, okay, back in the day, what I wanted to be when I grew up was to be a music video director. And my music video director brain is just sparkling about like this set and the lighting and like how the light is like creating this directional effect toward the door. I just love the whole vibe and look of all of this. It's so cool. Honestly, it feels very OG David Fincher. No, Mark Romanek. It's totally Mark Romanek. It's uh, Lenny Kravitz if you can't say no. The modern Bethesda games a lot of the time have really cool lighting setups, but I don't think I've seen them do much with moving lights though. Maybe this is something that they should start bringing into the actual game. So Maximus walks through. He sees this medical supplies door. He opens it up and this is when I'm going to start being annoyed because how could he not tell that wasn't a real door? Like for us watching a TV show, I see why we couldn't tell, but in real life, it would be really clear that there was no parallax. Also, my autism really wants to understand what happened between when they fell through the trap door and ended up laying on these gurneys. Like they weren't crumpled on the floor of some like dungeon thing going, oh, what happened? How did we get down here? Like, like, like they were clearly made unconscious and put on gurneys at some point. It's like the filmmakers really wanted to suggest that it's like they're dead and now we're in some sort of vault heaven. The sign that says caution falling objects subtly suggests that they are objects. Lucy gets up and walks over to the window and is relieved to find out, oh, thank goodness, they're only in a vault. Vaults are so safe. Nothing bad ever happened to anybody in a vault, right? I think her wording here is interesting and intentional. She says, we're in the best place in the world. We're in a vault. She doesn't say we're in one of the best places in the world. She says we're in the best place in the world. I think this is one of many examples where the show kind of wants us to be able to see that America and a vault can be interchanged. Like, she says we're in the best place in the world the same way a person might say we're in the best place in the world if we were in America or maybe in an American embassy. And she has this dreamy look on her face like she's living in a fantasy. Because she is. It looks like the official entrance to Vault 4 is above ground. One of these building type entrances that we can totally have as a shelter in Fallout 76. I had a shelter like that. <laughs> the Vault 4 doctor, Dr. Edmondson, removes the tooth bullet from Maximus's shoulder. Does anybody Anybody remember the movie Existence, Cronenberg, Guns with Tooth Bullets? I don't know. Very weird, but very cool movie. Anyway, moving on. He says, ugh, using teeth for ammunition, always finding new ways to kill each other up there, aren't they? I think it's telling that he refers to the people of the surface as they. They are always trying to find new ways to kill each other up there, aren't they? I feel like people are thinking less and less like that in a lot of circles on the internet. Like, I feel like I'd be more likely to say, we always find new ways to kill each other on the outside, don't we? Because I'm people and the people up there are also people 
people. And I feel like were I under those conditions, I would also be finding new ways to kill people. Like the luxury of the vault is the only reason I don't have to come up with new ways to kill people. Especially considering the fact that Vault 4 is a vault that takes in outsiders. That's supposedly integrating the cultures of the surface dwellers. We'll definitely talk about this in more detail once we get to know Overseer Benjamin. This is when Lucy and Maximus meet Birdie, who clearly has some sort of job in the vault where she's good at public relations, good at talking to people. She says she understands that they want to keep moving, but Maximus is probably going to need a couple days to recover from his injury. Maximus, of course, is like, no, I'm fine. Uh. But the doctor's like, you had a rotten human tooth lodged in your shoulder. You're not fine. With this cultural relativism stuff, that not only applies to what behavior we think is decent, but also what circumstances that we would qualify as fine. I'm suddenly reminded of the part in Nuka Break where he's like, victimless crime. You stole these? Victimless crime. How so? Nobody died. That's not- No, he's right. Lucy's like, Titus, this is a vault doctor. We should listen to his advice. And something in that egocentrism, like I feel like I could imagine somebody going, Titus, this is an American doctor. Bertie also tells them that they found Maximus's armor and that their surface foragers are bringing it back now. So Lucy gets comfortable thinking that she's talking to somebody like her. So she's like, I don't know if you've been to the surface, but woo wee. And this is when Bertie tells her that she was born on the surface. Turns out she's actually from Shady Sands. And a lot of people who lived in Shady Sands ended up in Vault 4 after the explosion. Because I can't help myself got to point out how I related to this conversation as an autistic person. It's starting to sound like Lucy was kind of starting to say some kind of judgy, kind of looking down her nose stuff about surface dwellers. So when Bertie says, I was born on the surface, Lucy's like, oh, well, sorry. You know, like she kind of recombobulates and is like, oh, sorry, just because you seem so... And then Bertie says, normal. <laughs> Generally, when people think of autism, they think of a little boy who can't talk who sits on an iPad all day. Or when they've met those of us who can talk, they're used to hearing a flat affect, no eye contact. They're expecting to see higher levels of what they would think is social dysfunction. And while obviously there are huge social benefits for seeming so normal, there's definitely some times where I want to jump in and make sure people know I have autism before they say something I don't want to hear. Bertie says she just needs them to stay in quarantine a few hours longer to make sure that they don't track in any contamination. So Max and Lucy get some alone time together. But I already talked about this scene in depth in my Let's Man Up video. What's important to mention here is how after we slowly dolly out, we see a sign above the door that says test subjects. Ooh. After quarantine, Lucy and Maximus eat with the other vault dwellers. And Lucy is just so relieved to be back in a vault again, eating vault food. But Maximus is more traumatized. He's more hypervigilant. Everything about this is weird for Maximus. But Lucy's like, you heard the doctor. You need to stay and heal and we made a deal and if you died I would feel bad. <laughs> It's funny, in TV show form, that's just a funny line, but I think it's extra funny for Fallout players because that's the same amount of kind of distance we have when we're making decisions in the game. Like, sorry, Mr. House, I can't blow up the entire Brotherhood of Steel bunker. I would just feel bad. When she says, you heard the doctor, she points at him and we get a very clear view of her replaced finger. And I'm kind of wondering if that's like the okie dokie thing where we need to pay attention to when that happens. Maximus's trauma sixth sense says, they're trying to trap us here which makes sense because there's something about this that feels like they're being seduced. First of all, the circumstances that put them in the vault were dishonest. They're clearly motivated to lure people into the vault. They're not just helping people that come and ask for help. Lucy points out, hey, a lot of these people are from the surface too. And Maximus is like, yeah, because this is a cult, same as any. Everyone is smiling. That's not natural. That's not normal. In a previous video, I said something like, a golden rule society might be an admirable goal, but if it requires oppressive control to achieve, humanity isn't there yet. Maximus lives in a world where humanity is not ready to be this happy unless there's something very wrong. And Lucy insists, no, this is a place where people take care of each other. And Maximus asks the question, but why? How are these people incentivized to take care of each other? And as much as I make fun of Lucy for being privileged, this is an example of where Lucy is not wrong and why we, the ghouls and Maximuses of the world, should really stop and listen to her. She says, well, because in the vaults, we recognize that we all need each other, just like I need you on the surface. And then she takes his hand and it's so cute. The reason why so far humans have needed coercive control to live in peace is because control brings stability, stability brings reliability, and that brings trust. Trust gives a feeling of safety, and that feeling of safety challenges the fear that makes people act like jerks. 
The reason highly resourced people still act like jerks is because they're constantly terrified of losing those resources. I just watched Pride and Prejudice the other day. It's just a bunch of really stressed out rich people trying to figure out how to hang on to their copious resources. Lucy's upbringing provided the perfect conditions for her to have a regulated nervous system because she was safe, she was secure, she had self-esteem, she had all the autonomy she knew how to desire, and she had a goal, a reason for being, something to look forward to, something to pursue, something to live for. I hate to say it, but vault tech created the perfect conditions to grow the kind of person who could make the world a better place. God damn it, I hate that vault tech actually got this one right. But for the sake of my argument, here's the important thing. She wasn't bullied into it. She wasn't tortured or controlled into it. And there's a lot of people in this world who strongly believe that we have to be mean to people to make them better people. You know, kids these days are the way they are because they're all spoiled. How has that theory been working? Seriously. Because I'm looking around and we have clearly not figured out how to bully people into being nice and happy yet. Oh, sorry there. Got a little bit of a tone. It's all that neurodivergent trauma. The point is... In order to make the world a better place, we must decide to trust people without being forced into it. <laughs> That's it. That's how we save the world. By giving people the benefit of the doubt and giving them the fucking ghoul serum like a badass love warrior. We need to trust people to function. So if we won't do it on our own, then people with guns will point them at our heads and say, trust me or die. That's what keeps happening. So when Lucy says people in vaults are good to each other because people need each other, just like you and I need each other on the surface, she's damn correct. That should be all the reason that we need to be nice and take care of each other. But why don't we? Let's say it together, kids, because we don't trust each other. So Maximus is starting to loosen up. He's starting to buy into it. But then Lucy says, give this place a shot and literally spoon feeds him. She literally spoon feeds him. I love Fallout because it's not subtle. For those of you who aren't familiar with the idiom of spoon feeding, to spoon feed something to someone basically means to help them in an overly simplistic or excessive manner. It specifically implies that the person being spoon-fed isn't thinking for themselves. Like it could be argued in a lot of my videos on this channel that I spoon-feed people what metaphors mean. Like right now, I'm spoon feeding you what spoon feeding means. So now Birdie is bringing by the overseer, the fantastic Chris Parnell. And he's got one eye, one big eye on the top of his head. And Lucy is surprised by this. So I talked about this in the Norm video. I have progressive leaning beliefs. And in that video, I talked about parodying progressives in a way that we deserve to be parodied. And there is something similar going on here. So I think it's a beautiful thing when a person wants to be open-minded, wants to be the kind of person who can embrace new cultures and new ideas. But I think it's really dangerous to be ego identified with being such a person because that means you won't respect your own internal signaling when you find yourself actually being distressed in a situation of cultural difference. Like, I think it's pretty clear that Lucy is a fair and open-minded person, but that doesn't change the fact that she's never seen a person in a vault suit with only one eye before. And so it's natural that she's going to have an emotional response to that. And I think in real life, all too often, people who see themselves as open-minded have that emotional response when they're experiencing a moment of cross-cultural discomfort, but they refuse to acknowledge that they're experiencing a moment of cross-cultural discomfort because they're afraid that means that's like admitting that they're some sort of bigoted jerk. And so... They end up fabricating, inventing some other reason they're having that emotion, and in turn actually end up becoming a bigoted jerk. And we are literally about to watch all of that happen to Lucy. She is totally thrown off by Overseer Benjamin for no other reason than what he looks like. For the most part, we're not even paying attention to anything that Overseer Benjamin says, except when he says, do not go to level 12, don't go to level 12, level 12 bad, don't go to level 12, because it kind of makes Lucy want to go to level 12. What is both hilarious and incredibly effective about this scene is how Max Maximus and Lucy are both totally disturbed by Overseer Benjamin for two totally different reasons. Maximus looks around and he's like, ah, they're laughing, they're smiling, everybody's too happy. Lucy's looking around and going, oh, he has an extra nose. Dr. Edmondson seems like a nice guy. He obviously said some stuff that rubbed me the wrong way, but I, something about him, I get good vibes. It's a shame we probably won't see that character again. So Lucy and Maximus talk about the weirdness of these people. And Lucy's like, yeah, but I mean, like, he's got one eye. And Maximus just does not think that's that weird. Lots of people have one eye. Yeah, but his is in the middle. <laughs> Maximus is like, a mm, little to the left. <laughs> 
I love this conversation because it's so funny and these conversations happen in real life all the time if you're dealing with any two people with different meaning making maps. That could be people who grew up in different cultures, but more often than not in my life, it's people with different neurotypes. How many times has somebody been like, I think your friend hates me and I'm like, dude, my friend is autistic. He just wants to watch his YouTube videos, dude. In holistic land, maybe somebody hates you if they don't talk to you for a week, but in autistic land, your friend doesn't talk to you for a week. That means Fallout season one just came out. So Lucy has this little meeting with Overseer Benjamin and it is so cringy. It feels like an amalgamation of every complaint that I've ever heard from somebody who immigrated to this country. The disrespect, mispronouncing her name. When he teaches her how to operate a toilet and then she goes, actually, I'm from a vault. The vibe of that really reminds me of things I've seen where a person of color is from America, speaks English because they're not white. There are really annoying assumptions made. The beginning of the music video for STFU by Rina Sawayama leaps to mind. Quite surprised you sang it, it, you know, in English. Well, I, I grew up here. So. Oh, love these. So authentic. You can't find good Japanese food outside of Japan. I almost feel like as a white person, I'm not the right person to be talking about what this scene is commenting on. If you've got stories, please share them in the comments. But it's clear he's not actually that interested in blending with the cultures on the surface. He's just going through the motions. He comes off like a total jerk and comes off like even more of a jerk when Lucy has the audacity to ask about level 12. So he shoes her away without giving her an explanation. And yeah, that's when Lucy gives up on level 12 and that's the end of the episode. <laughs> it's important to note that all that Overseer Benjamin is guilty of at this point is being a weird looking asshole. She is in no way entitled to investigate level 12 now. She's a guest in this place. At the moment, there's no evidence that she's imprisoned there. He's just stated a boundary of their community. Don't go to level 12. Giving her a reason why she shouldn't go to level 12 at this point would be a courtesy. It would be a nice thing to do, but he's not required to explain his boundaries. The only reason that she feels moved to betray his wishes is because of the anxiety and distrust she is feeling due to nothing but the fact that his big giant eyeball doesn't fit into her meaning making map of what a vault dweller is supposed to look like. And remember, she is a good person. The world would be so much of a better place if we would just admit when we were rude or disrespectful to people just because we were weirded out. Not even admit it to them, just admit it to ourselves so we could finally start making better decisions. So Maximus still doesn't trust this place. He wants his power armor back, but he doesn't have a fusion core anymore, so there's no point in having it without the fusion core, which leads to him asking the pertinent question, where do you guys get your power from? And one of the shots we love to see all these reactors, exactly what we would be using to put in our vaults in Fallout 4. So he comes very close to stealing a fusion core before he stopped by Birdie, who almost certainly knew what he was doing. In fact, she appears to be sympathizing with him a little bit, like she gets why he would feel the need to do something like that, why he wouldn't feel safe in that situation. She says our fusion core, implying they only have one. I still think it's confusing that they only have one. I mean, apparently they have foragers. You'd think they'd be trying to get more. She's being really nice. She's absolutely confirming his suspicions that she's trying to trap them, though. She doesn't sound like she has any interest in them leaving. But judging how things turned out, I think she's assuming that once they get an understanding of what's being offered to them, they're probably not gonna want to leave. She gives him a room to stay in, an opportunity to enjoy the amenities of vault life. I am absolutely living for that slight facial expression shift after he tastes the caviar. Like, oh, 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 what, what is, oh, what is this? I've honestly never had caviar before. What does it taste like? That childlike emotion when he stomps out and sees that guy and he's like, excuse me, what is this? He is so endearing. Lucy is charmed and feels much more at home once she sees the classroom. And her heart is just wide open for what happened to those poor people at Shady Sands. Blowing up Shady Sands, I think, was a good move for the Fallout franchise because I think it's good that something really big and significant like that happened. For those of you who don't know, Shady Sands goes all the way back to Fallout 1. It started with one of the vaults, Vault 15. According to the Fallout Bible, the population was designed to be a mix of radically diverse ideologies different cultures. It was a clusterfuck of a vault. Population control wasn't implemented properly. It got overcrowded, conditions deteriorated, and a lot of people left and ran off to form distinct communities, one of them being Shady Sands. Shady Sands ended up with Vault 15's Garden of Eden creation kit, and that was one hell of an advantage. And eventually it not only became a full-fledged thriving community, but it also became the origin point of the most successful military government situation that we see in the fall 
Fallout franchise, which would be the New California Republic. Patrolling the Mojave almost makes you wish for a nuclear winter. I think this was a good power equalization move for the franchise so that the New California Republic won't just continue to get more and more powerful <laughs> as the franchise continues, because if it just totally takes over, then we'll have civilization and bingo, bango, bongo, I want to stay right here. It's kind of haunting how Lucy feels so connected to this story and has no idea that she has been there. So then she goes through the timeline on the chalkboard and goes through a lot of the stuff I just talked about. Shady Sands founded, New California Republic created, 2241, NCR becomes the largest economic and political power in California. Now that is the year that Fallout 2 takes place. And then as many of us will never forget for the rest of our lives, this godforsaken unholy chalkboard says that the fall of Shady Sands happened in 2277 and the Fallout internet exploded. Y'all, I have never seen the Fallout fandom this united in being angry about something this specific <laughs> since what I will call the canvas bags incident. Look it up if you know you know. For those of you who are normal and sane, basically, here's the problem. Fallout New Vegas takes place in 2281. Shady Sands very much existed during the events of Fallout New Vegas. If Shady Sands had blown up four years before the events of New Vegas. I don't know, man. The Legion would have taken it. <laughs> Mr. House would have been sitting there like, well, that was a fun dream. Basically, it's just totally inconceivable. But then we were all like, uh, 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 there's an arrow. It shows the bomb happened after. And I remember thinking like, no, that's so dumb. If they're saying it happened after, then they would have put another year. Why would they not put what year? Why would all these other events deserve a year? But the bomb didn't. That doesn't make any sense. But I'll be goddamned, no, they came out and said the fall of Shady Sands is a different event. So something different happened in 2277 that they're calling the fall of Shady Sands. I don't know, man. I think they goofed. <laughs> I think they goofed and they're backpedaling now. I really do. The only justification that I can think of that they didn't goof is that they wanted to leave it vague when the bombs fell for some reason on purpose. Like for some reason they want to leave it open-ended. You know, kind of like how they left it totally open-ended why Mold Aver didn't age because they want us to be asking that question. But here's a hypothesis. It might be total BS, but it's kind of fun to me. Okay, so I think that they intended to imply that these bombs dropped immediately after Fallout New Vegas. Like basically as soon as they had wiggle room in the timeline to make a new thing happen, that's when they intended did this new thing to happen. I think maybe some PA was supposed to look up the year the previous game took place, and for whatever reason, instead of using the year of Fallout New Vegas, they used the year of Fallout 3. Because Fallout 3 takes place in 2277. So that would explain where somebody got that year, but it can't actually be relevant that this event, the fall of Shady Sands, happened at the same time as Fallout 3, because Fallout 3 takes place on the East Coast. Another reason, because even if the fall of Shady Sands, whatever that means, wasn't when these bombs exploded, whatever it was, was, it would be something that the NCR soldiers in New Vegas were familiar with because it happened four years before. Whatever it was, it was significant enough to be on this timeline, on this chalkboard, being taught to these kids. So wouldn't we have some clue of what it was from conversations with all the NCR soldiers that we talked to in Fallout New Vegas? Actually, if I'm wrong about that and there's an answer or there's a theory about what the fall is that lines up, lines up time-wise, I'm actually really curious. Tell me in the comments. And now it's time for the surface dweller tradition. Lucy sees a of people going in a direction and she's not autistic so she wants to go too. She asks a dude in a lab coat what's going on and he's like it's a surface dweller tradition. It's a little rambunctious for my taste. That's the word he uses, rambunctious. That's a condescending word in this context. It basically says they're out of control but they're so cute while they're doing it. Children and puppies are rambunctious. Clearly this vault has a class divide and this doctor and overseer Benjamin know what side of it they're on. Then a girl with the happiest eyes I have ever seen says to Lucy you're Welcome to come. So it looks like Lucy's gonna go do the thing. And then, remember when I said I wanted to do this video before the communism video? Big reason for that is because the show made the awesome choice of intercutting Cooper Howard going to the communist book club at Hollywood Forever with Lucy having her culture shock with the creepy flame mother ritual. The show is encouraging us to examine what we think makes a congregation of people creepy. And I think it's messaging that we really need right now because a lot of people are hurt and afraid and using that fear to justify justify being morality imperialists, just terrified to let people with different ideas exist. But the longer we don't let the people we disagree with exist, obviously the longer they're going to fight us because we are literally an existential threat. With the Shady Sands ritual and with the Kami meeting, I feel like Fallout is suggesting to us, hey, look at how wildly different a creepy congregation can look. And I feel like it kind of makes us examine, like, what is our criteria for what makes a group threatening? 
happening. So Lucy starts going through this ritual and she sees they're like lighting candles. It's full of a lot of just ritual cliches. In fact, if anybody watching this is a geek about this sort of thing, feel free to info dump in a comment about all of the things that this ritual references. In fact, that'd be a really interesting video if anybody wanted to do that. But the major point here is just how it looks weird. Like, is anything that we see here any more weird than like Catholicism? I don't think they even ever make it clear if those are real ashes or if that's even real blood. It could just be like, you know, Catholic stuff. And I think a great way to make the point of this looks weird, but nothing weird is going on is by showing boobs, letting all the, letting all the titties hang. Titties are the most harmless, controversial thing. <laughs> Not to invalidate anybody who has strong feelings about the topic. I mean, the way that the culture treats boobs and the way that culture treats people as a result of that, all very real effects, very real impact on the nervous system, wouldn't dream of invalidating it. However, all of those terrible effects, I do not believe would have happened if our culture didn't have just such a bizarre attitude about mammaries. That is not a global universal phenomenon. You can Google after me, but there are countless cultures that do exist and have existed that view toplessness as a normal and non-sexual part of daily life. Trust me, it's weird to me too, considering the deep down nervous system response that I have when I get to see glorious boobs. But the science says that response was learned. And I gotta ask, Birdie, was this character modeled after Teal Swan? It would be such a huge coincidence for me if she was. Okay, this is kind of a tangent, but it's gonna be fun. Trust me, you're gonna like it. So Teal Swan is a spiritual teacher, has a lot of content on YouTube, is often accused of being a cult leader. And she has a very strong resemblance to Birdie. She's got that really long, dark hair, similar shaped face and slender frame, fair skinned, and they both speak with this very soft, soothing, gentle, but also firm and to the point. That comforting, yet also unnervingly mysterious. Even though we have one body, we have multiple selves within that body. Three days walk from home and we could still feel the heat from the blast. And in 2020, when like everybody's lives went topsy-turvy because of the whole COVID thing, I was having my own psychological, spiritual crisis. The beliefs that I'd had up to that point had completely betrayed me and I was like ready for some new beliefs. And this is how a lot of people end up finding Teal Swan. So I watched a couple of her videos and they made a lot of sense to me, but I was really, really afraid of being had again. I felt like I had just escaped brainwashing and I didn't want more brainwashing. And these were ideas that were so different than what I had normally felt comfortable with. So I did what any autistic person would do in this situation. I researched the shit out of her and made an hour long YouTube video essay about her. But here's what I think is such a fun coincidence. If that video had a thesis, if it had a point, then that point would be basically the same point that this storyline on the show is trying to make about how just because something looks weird, and creepy doesn't mean it's a cult. They made a Hulu docu-series after I made my video that I honestly still haven't watched yet. So if more stuff has come out since I made the video, I honestly don't know. But at the time, I looked at everything. Seriously, everything I could find about this woman. And I certainly found evidence that would suggest she might be an asshole. Just like how Overseer Benjamin is an asshole. But an asshole with a different opinion that other people agree with and get something out of. I just don't think it's any of our business. That's what it really boils down to for me. It's like, yeah, I look at people who go run off to live with Teal Swan and I'm like, that's not for me. But I don't think I have to call her a cult. I mean, I feel the same way about people who join the military or like move to Los Angeles. I don't know why you would do that to yourself, but that's you. Whoa, incredible thought just hit me in the editing process. Gotta throw it in here. The vibe of that scene when Lucy is totally weirded out by the overseer's one eye and Maximus is like, lots of people have one eye. I mentioned that's a vibe I related to explaining neurodivergent people to other people. This is exactly how I felt about Teal Swan. I feel like Lucy here, that's like how the average neurotypical reacts to somebody like Teal Swan. And I'm the Maximus going, seems all right to me, dude. I don't see the problem. Can't resist an opportunity to tie things together. It makes my points make more sense. Obviously, we're all aware this is coming from an autistic perspective, but I don't like how the word cult makes it okay for people to judge communities that they find weird and scary within objective terms. The individual should decide whether or not they think this community or that 
that community is bad. And I think that we should be judging communities on their merits instead of whether or not they are a cult. I don't mean the freaking cult checklist. I mean like an individual should have their own opinion of what that community represents. The word cult is usually only dropped if the person dropping the word doesn't want you to buy into that culture for some reason. But it's none of their business. Communities and cultures alter, consume, and infiltrate our individuality. So from where I'm sitting, the only relevant question is which cult are you gonna let do that to you? The one your parents approve of or a different one? From my perspective, the only difference between a cult and a not cult is that the not cult somehow convinced you it's not a cult. So between the weird ritual and the weird mutations, Lucy feels completely justified that these people aren't safe. Meanwhile, poor Maximus was actually coming around. He's got his little robe and she looks at him and then she takes a moment to think about what all of this must be like from his perspective and I'm gonna do that thing I do sometimes where I get weirdly personal. The dialogue that she says to him here. I get why you'd want to stay. Okay, I really do. I I know this must all seem really nice compared to the, the shoot show that's up there. I wouldn't blame you if you wanted to go back on our deal and, and just be somewhere that is good and safe. But this isn't it. It hits me in places because like, I've mentioned before that the lifelong dream was to go be a film director and go to Hollywood and, and it was just a really chaotic way to live. It really wasn't healthy or good for me. And I had to get out of it and I had to survive and plopped myself down in a situation that seemed safe on a superficial level. Roof over my head, air conditioning, food to eat, physical safety, the whole deal. But it was an absolutely disastrous place for me, psychologically, emotionally, spiritually. It was eating my nervous system from the inside out, so... Something about what she says to him there, it's like, it's like what my inner guiding voice was telling me when I decided to get out of that. I talked about this a lot in the Norm video. For some people, the perks of a luxurious life have historically been used as psychological shackles that make allowing yourself to be imprisoned feel like a rational choice. They gave me a robe and slippers. <laughs> but now that Lucy needs to prove to Maximus that Vault 4 isn't on the up and up, she has an excuse to get to the bottom of whatever's going on on level 12. This is totally one of those situations that you could totally put Fallout game graphics over. Like when Overseer Benjamin was like, don't go to level 12, there should be this little new quest alert pop up investigate level 12. When she's looking around and seeing all like the heads and jars and stuff, all of this feels so much like looking around a space in a Fallout game. She looks at a screen that's playing this horrific video of a woman giving birth to weird creatures that immediately eat her. She sees the chamber of this horrific event is in the room, so it happened there whenever it happened. And then she sees more pods that have pregnant women in them, leading her to believe that this crazy crap is still going on. The same doctor from earlier, the one with the nose on his head that helped Maximus with his shoulder, comes in and appears to be taking care of the women in the pods. When the doctor hears a noise, he doesn't know what the heck is lurking in the dark, so he he grabs this specimen control harpoon, and when he sees her, she throws acid in his face. And I'm wondering, did she know that was acid? Was that a science skill thing? Was there something about the container that said, yep, this is an acid container? <laughs> was it conveniently labeled acid? Vault 4 naturally defends itself, and Lucy has a cute little fight scene. She's got some moves. And these next couple lines, okay. I've said multiple times that I love how not subtle Fallout is. This is the first time where I just thought they were way too on the nose. Lucy cries out, you people are crazy. Your entire culture is insane. And then defensively, Birdie says, I'm sure if we came to your home, we would say the same thing. That is so on the nose. I think that that line is too much. I'm like, why am I even here making videos if they're just gonna straight up tell you what the theme is? Cultural relativism. What's crazy to you isn't crazy to somebody else. Else, we get it. The only thing that makes this line really work in my head is I imagine that since Vault 4 takes in outsiders regularly, there's probably a lot of cross-cultural controversy and conflict with people insulting each other's cultures. Like maybe it's a thing that she said a lot in a lot of different situations. Meanwhile, Maximus over here, he's just chilling. <laughs> he's just watching a waterfall. Like that's it. Later when he sees Lucy being carried away, the same image is on the screen. He's basically watching a screensaver. So now Lucy is in custody. Overseer Benjamin and Birdie look very disappointed. Birdie's like, we let you into our home. But Lucy's like, I saw what you were doing to those poor women. That is like some Clive Barker, H.R. Giger, hentai 
shit going on back there. So they're like, okay, she needs to see the holotape. Birdie starts to roll the tape, and Lucy's like, what is this? And Birdie says, your history. The tables are turned. We remember that Birdie is from Shady Sands. She's not originally a vaulty. Lucy's the vaulty. It's Lucy's weird ass people who are responsible for all of Vault 4's weird assery. Anyway, so we see the scientists again, the same ones that we saw at the beginning of the episode, and basically see that their scientist run vault experiment fell apart spectacularly. And as this guy's life is crashing down around him, he's like, I want to reiterate that a society governed by scientists really is the ideal social structure. What happened here should not be used as a case study for what happens when scientists are given unregulated control. (laughs) See, that's the kind of fallout not subtle that I like. So this was like the Andrew Ryan vault. And hybridizing humans with radioactive resistant species still has potential. That's right, my man. Go down with the ship. Be proud. Our test subjects were less compliant than we expected. And I feel like it was just for fun. They're like, let's explain that that's where the gulper came from. That was cute. I liked it. Overseer Benjamin is all emotional. He's like, sorry, I haven't seen that footage in a long time. And Lucy's all discombobulated. Like, wait, 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 wait. What is the, what did I just see? How does that relate to you? What is going on? And Birdie's like, my dude, it was vault Tech that made this place f- up, we unfucked it. Apparently, these heroic scientists that we met at the beginning of the episode lured Wastelanders to experiment on them. Yeah, no wonder they weren't cooperative. Overseer Benjamin is like, the creature in the video is actually my great uncle Peter on my mom's side, which I guess is like, huh, gulpers used to be people? Am I interpreting that wrong? So Lucy's like, I'm so sorry, my vault is not like that. And that's when Overseer Benjamin asks the dun 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 question, what was the experiment in 33? And Lucy is confused. Well, there, there is no experiment. Experiment, like, experiment? What, vault experiments? I have not heard of such a thing. And then Birdie has a damn good line here. She says, your ignorance cannot excuse your cruelty. Ooh, that's a louder for the people in the back. Yeah, y'all, it matters whether or not we hurt people. It matters what our intentions are, absolutely. I think our ignorance should be taken into consideration if anybody's passing judgment, but it absolutely does not excuse our harm. Brody rightfully is like, we brought you into our home. You deliberately disobeyed, like the one rule we gave you for reasons based entirely in fear and prejudice. You injured people. So, like, you're not just gonna, like, get to go now. (laughs) Stuff should happen. Your brother Norm would agree. You came in from the outside and you hurt people in their community. It is prudent to have a justice-y response to that. I think that's why they wanted to have her say, I'm a good person, I'm a good person here. She is a good person. If you find the concept of a good person useful, which I do less and less every day, this situation being a good example, why? Because it doesn't matter how good a person you are if you hurt people. There isn't something magical under your actions that you can expect other people to believe in when your actions fail them. Once again, if you're ego identified with being a good and open-minded person, then it'll blind you to seeing the context in which you're actually capable of being not so good a person. That's why I didn't like it when the doctor was like, they always find new ways to kill each other because if he were in that situation, then he would do the same. This show, Lucy, they're showing us that even a good man can do bad things because it doesn't matter if you're a good person or a bad person to anyone on the goddamn planet other than you. It's the things, it's the things that matter. Dude with acid on the face does not care how good a person you are. If you need to reconcile how good a person you are, then please do it. But that's between you and you. On that note, whoever needs to hear it, don't pressure people to forgive you, okay? Back to Maximus, that silly bastard still watching that waterfall. Somebody really needs to tell him, you know. Don't go chasing waterfalls. Stick to the rivers and the lakes that you're used to. I mean, I know you're going to have it your way. That is back-to-back TLC references two videos in a row. Dude, if anybody involved in the production can actually get me the footage of the waterfall (laughs) asking for a friend. Maximus hears and thusly looks up and sees Lucy being carried off. And you can see it on his face. He is just so disappointed. They they gave him a robe and he got so comfy and then then they would go and do this. Oh, 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 they are so gonna get it. They are so gonna get it right after he has one more bite of this delicious popcorn, that is. Lucy is now facing her fate. Of course, Vault 4 is gonna have an unusual justice ritual. Birdie says, we are all survivors here. Lucky enough to have found the sanctum of peace, of tolerance, as Lucy struggles for her life. 
and the crowd forebodingly chants, chants in a way that does not sound like Lucy's not about to get executed. It doesn't matter where you come from or what you believe, you deserve safety. Are they making fun of progressives again? I didn't even notice literally until right now. It just reminds me of how people can sound so hostile and so aggressive while they claim to be shouting such peaceful, warm and fuzzy ideas. Remember a little while back, I said that there was indeed a scene in the Fallout TV show that triggered me, that offended me. We are upon that moment now. Hopefully you also remember when I said that just because a scene triggered or offended me doesn't mean I think the scene needs to be cut out of the show and shot into space and sucked into a black hole and erased from all time and space. I'm a traumatized autistic person. I'm triggered by shit all the time. And yes, I deserve like compassion and consideration from people, but I'm also responsible for my own nervous system and I manage my relationship with potentially triggering television. Frankly, I'm kind of creeped out by the idea of living in a world where no one's allowed to make content that might trigger me. So I just want y'all to keep that in mind in the event that you find yourself mad at me for being vulnerable and sharing my emotions with you now. So right now, Lucy is afraid of being executed. She fears for her life. And then the one-eyed overseer steps menacingly onto the scaffold. He says she's sentenced to death. Amusing twist, by banishment to the surface. Okay, Lindsay, what's so triggering about that? Well, because then he starts using that big scary knife he was just holding to saw through the bounds around her wrists. And the position that he's standing in, and the way he's moving his body, the positioning of his hands and the knife, his gross little grunting sounds. They're clearly trying to make it look like he is enjoying an intense moment of self-reflection. He even says almost there. <laughs> so why did this trigger me? Why did this offend me? My favorite band's Ninja Sex Party. What, I can't handle a dick joke? It's the context, dudes. It made me feel a little bit Anita Sarkeesian. I feel like I must have pointed out more than once how airtight the writing in this show is. The gags never happen in a vacuum. They are always thematic consistent. Like when Lucy said Moldaver steals dads. It wasn't just a cute funny joke, it also said something about her egocentric privileged perspective. So what is this scene saying? The scene is saying that being on is no big deal. It's saying if you're in a situation where it looks like you might die and it turns out all that the guy wants to do is on your face that you should be relieved. But like I said, I wouldn't want to live in a world where entertainment never offended me. I see it as an opportunity to think. This is a show, the second episode, they threw a newborn puppy into an incinerator. It's not going to be delicate with me. I wouldn't expect it to be. What is Fallout trying to show me right now? First of all, they brilliantly foreshadowed that Overseer Benjamin was going to tell a joke that was going to piss me off. He said it earlier himself. I can't even tell a funny joke without pissing people off. And I'm watching him do this gross thing and I'll be like, my god, he's doing it. They're just trying to make a funny joke and I'm taking it the wrong way. Sometimes it's creepy how good the writers on this show are. And I also think that there's a reading of the joke that's actually a little bit constructive. And that's in relation to not judging women who have ever had to make a choice like this. Since the dawn of time, women have been judging other women for the sexual decisions that they have made for survival and resources. Hey, I can make another reference to Pride and Prejudice. Like when Charlotte says to Lizzie, I'm 27 years old, I have no money and no prospects. I know Mr. Collins sucks, but don't freaking judge me. Bridgerton season one, Marina, expresses very similar sentiments in a very similar context. Just watch that TV show, The Deuce. There's a bartender who asks this prostitute, like, why aren't you doing something else? And the prostitute's like, why don't you mind your business? So that's like three TV references to this kind of situation off the top of my head. Maybe it's good for us to remember that when it looks like people are making choices that we don't respect, we really don't have a sense of their options. Oh, kind of like when you have stuff to say about YouTubers who use AI. Just saying. So yeah, it turns out these people are just totally adorable. They're banishing her to the surface, but they're doing it with a care package. Lucy adorably vouches for Max Maximus. Like, he deserves to live somewhere safe. But Maximus thinks she's in trouble and he knows where the fusion core is and where his suit is, so he goes to get the fusion core to get the suit to go be a hero. And this makes me nervous to watch. Like, I think he seriously injured people. Good thing Stimpaks are magic. There's something about the image of him throwing that new Coca-Cola machine that is iconic in my mind now. And then Lucy has to awkwardly tell him, actually, they're letting me go. The power armor, nervous finger wiggle, also iconic. 
Lucy and Maximus are now outside of Vault 4, and what have we learned today, kids? Lucy's like, dude, we took their fusion core. But Maximus is like, yeah, well, but I needed it for the suit. Well, they need it for, like, their power. And he's like, well, how am I going to be a knight without the suit and the fusion core? I don't, I don't understand. Also, there is a new level of curl in Lucy's hair that I think is a continuity disruption. They are kind of talking to each other like little kids here, though, but it just feels so fallout. This was Tim Kaine's vision. If you were out in the wasteland and you weren't beholden to any civilization, what choice would you make in these kind of situations? I don't view art as something that provides answers. I look at art as something that asks questions and you answer. Looking at Fallout through that lens, you can say, well, what questions does Fallout ask you? Fallout says, how would you act when removed from all the constraints of society? Would you help people? Would you kill people? Would you just walk around as a complete opportunist? Or do you explore? Or do you follow the story slavishly and you're like, all this other stuff is distraction. The side quests are distraction. And then finally, when faced with choices, what choice do you pick when you absolutely are forced to choose? Not when you're just acting on your own, but when you're forced to choose, do you go selfish or selfless? I also really liked it when Moldaver was like, tricky little choices. Fallout is about making choices and accepting those consequences. You know, accepting the fallout. And I hope this is a thing that they keep doing on the show. Analyzing choices. Like when Maximus says, but without the fusion core, without the armor, I can't help people. I can't help you. That's a really relatable thing to deliberate over. There are a lot of things that I engage in that I have a lot of moral qualms with. I just listed them in my AI video, you know, using AI. How much I order from Amazon. I could go on and on. But like, like, there's a bare minimum that I need to do to just maintain myself enough to, like, give anything back to society. At the end of my AI video, I was even like, hey, with my classes using these AI-generated pictures, I might be helping somebody who's destined to defeat the AI menace once and for all. And then when Lucy's like, if my dad found out that I destroyed an entire community to save him... <laughs> That would break his heart. And you know what's funny? That might actually be true. He might want Lucy to be better than he is. So Maximus is like, eh, buzzkill. They give back the fusion core. They go Paragon. And he has to turn away from the suit that made him feel like such a man. Oh, Maximus. Coming back for your buddy. So they drop the fusion core down the trap door. The janitor's like, thank you. Their consciences are more or less clear. And they are thoroughly trauma bonded. So Lucy's like, well, marrying a stranger didn't work out too well last time. Fuck it. Wanna shack up? And Maximus really liked his vault life test drive. But I mean, now he's got to tell the girl the truth. So he's like, I'm not Titus. I'm Maximus. He died. I watched like not like a psycho, but more like an indifferent dude who wanted his suit. Still wasn't very like good person shit though. And she's like, Chumba. I threw acid on some guy's face. <laughs> and I've only been here two weeks. I am not judging you. Once again, y'all, Lucy has all the answers. And that's what I want to end on, y'all. The story of Vault 4 is the story of not necessarily don't judge people because we all have to make judgment calls to make decisions about the people we encounter in life. It's more be humble about those judgments. Examine where they came from. If you feel threatened or suspicious, always allow yourself to feel those feelings. Don't push them away. Just recognize that while all feelings are valid, not all interpretations of feelings are accurate. In fact, most of them aren't. And I think the most important thing to take from this storyline is even Lucy, Lucy, that perfect angel, acted like a bigoted, violent jackass. But we love her. Why? Because she took the absolute best possible lesson from the whole experience. She was gentle with herself, and by extension, she was gentle to Maximus. That's what we're supposed to be doing, Internet. We're supposed to be safe to make mistakes, apologize, hold ourselves accountable, and after doing so, recognize what it feels like to make mistakes and extend grace to others when they make theirs. But instead, we are generally in denial of our own mistakes, and if other people make a mistake, we hold it over their heads and expect everybody else to also hold it over their heads for the rest of their life, lest we appear that we don't take the infraction seriously. We are embarrassingly intolerant of the inevitability of human imperfection. It's like we think if we attack mistakes hard enough that people will stop making them. But no, because people will continue to make them, these ridiculous, unrealistic expectations are just making people lie to themselves and each other. As a culture, we've got to figure out how to say bad behavior is bad without saying people are bad because until we do, we're making it damn hard to get people to hold themselves accountable for bad behavior. After all, 
they're a good person. Lucy grew up with a lot of privilege, had her self-esteem very well nurtured. She grasps that it's possible that she just acted like an absolute jerk, but she's still a good person. She didn't learn from that, I'm a bad person. She learned from that. Wow, even somebody as good as me is capable of this. So I should extend that grace to others. Once again, thank you, Lucy. And thank you, Vault 4, for reminding us to look at our blind spots and to forgive ourselves when we find them. And that was the Vault 4 video. Man, we're on a roll. <laughs> as you can see, this shooting setup situation is evolving. I'm actually really feeling this uh, light coming from the monitor look. I mean, it's not really from the monitor, it's a... It's a light, you can see it. It's lies! But I am really looking at my monitor right now. So I can see things are recording. It's just, it's very cozy. I'm really into this. And if you can believe it, it is broad fucking daylight right now. That means I can do this shooting setup any time of day. I don't know where I'm gonna go with it next. Probably just gonna be like this for a little while. I'm actually super pumped. I finally have a camera angle where you can see my shirts. I have an extensive t-shirt collection and I never leave this basement. So these videos, it's like my only hope for people to ever see my t-shirts. This is a Jurassic Park um, anniversary shirt. Sorry if I triggered any dinosaur autistics out there. For those of you who didn't see my post, thank you to everybody who donated to help me get my media server. It is up and running, transferring files at this very moment. I cannot wait to start organizing everything. So let's do the housekeeping. That's what they call this kind of thing, right? Housekeeping? I have never had this good of like a rhythm of YouTube video output probably ever. Not since like the Dins in like 2013 for the one person watching who might know what that even is. And I'm finding that now it's good for me to have like a thing a week. Like kind of make it a habit to churn out, you know, little shorts here and there across different accounts, but like this Vault 4 video is like a thing and the AI video on the other channel is a thing and I can pick one thing to do a week and I think I can stay productive. And lately it's been jumping back and forth between those channels, but I also have to do the things, you know, the money things. I have mentioned before how we were teaching those autistic holistic classes. We are gonna be selling those classes on Sheila's website and I need to be working on promo for those classes, like clips from the classes. We've needed clips from classes for so long. And as an autistic person, I should know this because we don't like buying tickets for things without seeing an example of what we're buying a ticket for. So that's gotta be my thing next week. And then after that, in the spirit of keeping both channels alive, I gotta do another video for the Lindsay Makes Videos channel. Puts another week delay on this channel. I thought it would actually help me kind of stick to the plan if I said this at the end of the video. I kind of like our little moments together at the end of the videos. Do you like these? It's working really well for me. So that gives you all some time to give me your thoughts and ideas for the next video in the comments on this video. Because it is still kind of a messy nebulous concept right now because I'm not exactly going to be talking about communism in the Fallout universe or communism on the show. What I want to talk about is how there's an attitude, a cultural attitude that I relate to. I guess you could say American millennial, an attitude that we have about communism and the way that our parents and grandparents talked about communism. It's built a particular attitude and I'm seeing that attitude reflected on the Fallout TV show, throughout Fallout games, and other shows as well. And so I'm trying to figure out like how I should package that idea in a way that people won't think it's clickbait. Like, cause if they expect to click on it and see like a breakdown of communism in the Fallout franchise, then they're gonna be disappointed, you know? In fact, I've thought a lot about how I don't want to research communism at all before making this video because I'm talking about like a cultural attitude. I almost feel like a big part of that perspective involves how we are so heavily conditioned on how we're supposed to feel about communism without people actually educating us on why we should feel that way. So the fact that I'm relatively ignorant about communism actually supports my point. So if you've got thoughts on that, please share them. And one more thing, I can't imagine making this communism video without having footage of Liberty Prime. I need footage of Liberty Prime. And normally, like I've said, I generally record all of my own footage that I use in my videos, but I've never even gotten close. My PlayStation 4 game might be pretty close and I could record it on there. It'll be lower quality. But if somebody could send me as much like Liberty Prime footage that I can use, or what would really tickle me is if somebody could send me a save that starts like right before the Liberty Prime stuff so I can record the footage. A place to get Fallout saves so I don't have to play to certain places to record footage of it. If anybody has a resource to get me Fallout saves, 
in general. Oh my god, you would change my life. And on the flip side, if anybody out there needs Cyberpunk 2077 saves, I can probably get you to like any quest in the entire game. Cool, if there's anything I forgot to say, it'll be in the description. Please be nice in the comments, I have a very delicate nervous system. And while it might be a long time before a long video, you'll probably see me pop up in posts and shorts. If you have to go out, take a gun and a lamp. Everybody knows there's a devil in camp.